Awesome, thanks. Uh, so everyone, um, I'm Matt Price. I'm a principal research engineer at ZeroFox, uh, based out of Baltimore. Um, and at ZeroFox, I lead our data science program. Um, so I was told I had to come up with a clever title for this presentation. So this is what you get, the snake in your data. Um, specifically, what I'm going to be talking about is how Python is used today uh, by data science teams, uh, and specifically how we use it at ZeroFox. <coughs> while the slides were switching. Um, so in terms of what we'll be talking about today, uh, I'll talk a little bit about ZeroFox, um, really just to give you a background into the kinds of problems we're going to solve, like we are trying to solve at ZeroFox, uh, because I'll be referring to our architecture and where Python fits into that. Um, I'll go over the data science lifecycle a little bit, just so you can understand where the tools fit in um, as we're going through the data science uh, process. Um, I'll talk about the data science that we do at ZeroFox, and then I'll talk about um, some of the tools, really, in kind of like a whirlwind tour. Um, and then lastly, if the demo gods are working with me, I will give you a live demo of Prodigy, um, which has been one of the hands-down most helpful tools I've ever used uh, in my career. So ZeroFox, um, we're a cybersecurity company. Uh, specifically, we focus in digital risk protection. And what that means is that we focus on protecting companies and individuals from security threats and risks that are present on digital media. Um, and this can involve anything from social engineering to IP leakage and data loss, impersonators, scams, uh, like malicious domains, reputation tax, and so on. Um, a good way to think about what we do at ZeroFox is we protect companies from everything outside of their firewall. So the way that we do this is we hook into a number of digital channels, like hundreds of them, actually. Um, everything from Facebook to Twitter, uh, Slack, domain registrars, websites, uh, forums on the dark web. Um, if it's out there on the internet, we try to go get it for our customers. Um, what happens is that the content arrives within the system, and then my job and my team's job is to surface relevant information to our customers. Uh, this is a very challenging problem, because every day we're getting tens of millions of unique pieces of content. Um, and that content comes in a variety of different formats um, and, and media representations, everything from text to images, uh, even audio and video. So in order to make sense of this data uh, and provide additional uh, context to our customers, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, which is what Python enables. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. So with that, let's move into the data science lifecycle. So uh, the pyramid you see there on the right is really how I think about the data science lifecycle. Um, and it's broken in, I've broken it into really 10 distinct uh, stages. Um, the lifecycle really starts with defining the problem. Uh, once you've done that, you can go out and start collecting data, um, cleaning it, creating labels, doing feature engineering. Uh, most of the work that we do is supervised learning, um, building models, uh, evaluating those models, and Assuming all of that went well, uh, actually deploying that model out into production. Uh, the reason I like representing the data science lifecycle as this upside down pyramid is that at each stage in, the, um, in this pyramid, it's a rough indicator of how much time that you spend on each step. Um, so it's not like truly reflective of the amount of effort for each stage, but it, it's actually fairly accurate. Um, you can see that the large bulk for any kind of data science project that you undertake is, involves data. Uh, whether it's collection, um, cleaning it, or just exploring and understanding what your data is before you build the model. So one of the keys to understanding this life cycle is that it's an iterative process, and each of these steps builds on the other. So based on what you find in certain steps, uh, you actually may have to back that process up. So for example, during feature engineering, you may identify that there's a key feature that you need to make your model more accurate. Um, in that case, you may have to go back and grab additional data, um, or you need to reformat the existing data that you have and pull additional information out of it. Uh, the other piece of this pyramid is as you move down that life cycle pyramid, the project is growing matur maturity and ideally is getting closer to a deliverable that actually addresses the business problem that you defined at the first stage. Uh, at ZeroFox, we use Python uh, to enable the work that we do at each stage in this data science life cycle. Um, and this is really made possible by the ecosystem of tools that have been developed around scientific computing in Python. 
So now let's talk a little bit about data science and how we view it at FireEye and some of the work that we actually do. So a lot of the work that we do um, involves focusing on artificial intelligence, which, as most of you probably know, is just the simulation of intelligent behavior in machines. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is distill the knowledge that the analysts at ZeroFox and our customers have into code, into something that we can automate so that those people can then be freed up to work on more important tasks. Uh, the two areas of artificial intelligence that we specifically focus on are natural language processing and computer vision, uh, given the type of content that's coming through our system. Um, and these are largely enabled through machine learning um, and uh, deep learning nowadays, which tends to be state of the art in both of those fields. Here I wanted to briefly introduce um, what I view as the data science architecture we have at ZeroFox, because I'll be referring back to this a bunch uh, as I introduce the tools and show you where we're using them um, at ZeroFox. So on the production side, uh, we're obviously ingesting all this content from the internet, and then it ends up at this enrichment step. This enrichment step is where we're running all of our data science capabilities. Some of them are as simple as signature lookups in a database that we maintain, Others are more complicated, such as optical character recognition, um, scam detection using natural language uh, classifiers, and so on. Um, after this enrichment, what emerges is ideally data that has additional context that we can then uh, use our rule engine to surface those relevant alerts to our customers. When those alerts get um, sent to our customer, they then take some kind of action. It may be a takedown. It may be simply closing the alert because it's a false positive. So on the other side, we also have this analysis environment. On the analysis side, uh, one of the key things that it starts with is labeling. Uh, from labeling, we are able to then start developing models, do the training, and then finally performance analysis. Uh, the performance analysis we do is not just for the models that we train. We're also mo currently, we also monitor all the models that we're running in production. Uh, because oftentimes real life is very different than the data set you may end up building, as some of you may have found out. Uh, another really important thing to mention about our architecture is the feedback loop that we have. Um, so every time our customers or our analysts are taking actions on these alerts, that's inf that information is flowing back into our labeling system, which then helps to improve our models and also gives us an idea how our models are actually performing. Uh, the other thing to note about this diagram is everything that you see that's uh, in green is enabled by Python. Um, and as we go through this, I'll show you the actual tools. So now, um, now that we've really discussed the, the data science life, life cycle and the architecture we have at ZeroFox, um, here's some of the specific tools that we use to, to really facilitate some of this work. To make it a little bit more digestible, uh, I've broken these, um, the tools that we use into four groups. Uh, obviously, the tools can cross these different categories that I've created, but just to keep things simple, I just drop them into a, a single bucket. The categories that I really think our tools fit into are data manipulation, data visualization, modeling, and deployment. Uh, data manipulation is really how do we represent the data that we're working with in a format that the machine can understand and work with. Uh, data visualization, on the other hand, is how do we as humans understand the data that we're working with. Modeling is just teaching machines uh, to, under, to really learn the underlying patterns in the, in the data. So this is kind of your traditional artificial intelligence machine learning uh, tools. And then finally, deployment, possibly one of the most important things, is after we've done all this work, we need to get this stuff out into production so people can actually use the results of our models. So in terms of data manipulation tools, these are really the four major ones that we use. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard about NumPy. Um, at this point, it's pretty inseparable from Python itself. And it, this is really the key package that gave rise to Python um, being kind of like the powerhouse that it is in numerical computing tests. Uh, the power of NumPy is that it represents matrices through data structures, um, generally through N what's called the ND array data structure. Um, Beyond just this representation of data, NumPy obviously has a number of mathematical and statistical functions that can work with these. And another um, reason that NumPy is so big in the Python community is that behind the scenes, it's really driven by C, C++, and Fortran. Um, 
So when people start talking about, oh, you need to vectorize your code or do things like that, what they're saying is you need to push those kind of operations off to NumPy so that the faster code, the C, the C code, the Fortran code, can run. Um, and you can avoid those for loops within Python. Uh, similar to NumPy is Pandas. Um, again, its key data structure is matrix-based. Um, you interact with the matrix through what's called a data frame. Uh, personally, I find Pandas to be very useful for time series data, uh, which I don't think NumPy is as great at handling. Um, so whenever you're working with like moving windows, date shifting, and so on, um, Pandas is usually like our go-to um, uh, tool for that. Uh, and again, in my personal opinion, I find Pandas can be very fast, uh, but I find it a lot less straightforward than NumPy um, to kind of like optimize. Moving over to the computer vision side, um, OpenCV is really the heavyweight that we use. Uh, so most people, it, I mean, it's in the name, so most people probably know that OpenCV is a computer vision library, um, but most people don't realize that OpenCV also has a number of machine learning capabilities built into it. Not just, um, obviously, the operations that you can run that use machine learning behind the scenes, but they also have implementations of machine learning classifiers as well. Uh, what's nice about OpenCV is that it's fairly performant uh, because its focus is really on processing real-time video. Uh, and it also works on images, but that's why it's so performant, is that focus on real-time video. Behind the scenes with OpenCV, uh, images or video frames are just represented as numpy arrays, and they then undergo operations in OpenCV. Um, OpenCV, uh, similar to NumPy, is mostly written in C++ with an interface that you can then call from Python. Um, and another interesting thing is even though OpenCV has implemented a lot of these machine learning classifiers, uh, it also supports integrations with TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, and you can do that by transferring uh, model weights between those different frameworks. Uh, something that you may have worked with is Pillow. Um, as this is a little bit higher level uh, library than OpenCV, which really has the basic building blocks. Pillow, I think, has higher level operations that you can perform on images. Um, so a lot of times I, he I hear this confusion, but Pillow is not Pill. Um, Pill, which was the Python uh, imaging library, was uh, an old library that people used to use to manipulate images, and then development on it kind of died. So it was forked into what is now Pillow. So Pillow is really the continuation of Pill, but they are still two different things. Um, personally, I find Pill to be most useful when you have either basic operations or high-level operations that you want to perform on an image. Uh, a great example of this is creating thumbnails. Um, that's just an operation that you can call on the, uh, the image class in Pillow versus OpenCV. You kind of have to create your own thumbnail operations to do that. An interesting thing to note about Pillow is that a lot of the modeling frameworks use Pill uh, behind the scenes. So if you've ever worked with uh, Keras's like image generator or PyTorch's uh, torchvision.transforms, they're actually using pill behind the scenes to do that image augmentation. In terms of where these tools fit in and the uh, our architecture, honestly, they're all over. Um, you cannot use <laughs> any of the other tools really without at some point touching like num NumPy, OpenCV, or Pillow. Uh, the one thing I do want to note is that the only place that we really use pandas in our architecture is in performance analysis. And a lot of, and a lot of that is because we're analyzing our models um, from a temporal standpoint, uh, because models obviously kind of, their performance generally decays over time. So using pandas to kind of deal with those uh, time-based operations is um, kind of a sweet spot for it in our architecture. So data viz, uh, da there's a number of data visualization tools and I just dropped Jupyter into here, even though I necessarily wouldn't consider it a um, data visualization, visualization tool in and of itself. Uh, so if you ever heard of IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, this is, this is that tool. Um, and what's really powerful about Jupyter um, notebooks is that it's essentially like a visual repo, like a read, uh, read, evaluate, print loop in your browser. And that's what really makes these notebooks so powerful. So you can take this code that's interpreted run it, and then it'll actually return its output to the browser. Um, another interesting thing is that behind the scenes, Jupyter Notebooks are just JSON documents. And they actually worked with GitHub to allow native rendering of uh, Jupyter Notebooks in GitHub, which personally I love. 
Um, and the way that Jupyter works is that behind the scenes, you have these things called kernels. Um, in this context, it, could be, it would be a Python kernel, but you can have Julia, R, um, and I believe there's a couple of other languages too. But these kernels are processes that run this code that you're inputting into the notebook and then return that output to the user. Matplotlib, uh, I'm sure most of you have run into that at some point, as this is like really the de facto uh, plotting library for Python. Um, and it's designed to work really well with NumPy, which is quite nice. Um, one interesting thing to note is that out of the box, it does support 2D plots, but a lot of the plots that we have started to move into are actually 3D plots, and there are extensions to MATLAB um, that do support these 3D plots. Another uh, kind of visualization library that's recently um, kind of risen in pop popularity is Seaborn. And Seaborn really arose um, because it's designed to make it easier to produce these attractive statistical graphs, which you can do in matplotlib, but you're going to have to work for it because all the operations that you do in matplotlib are pretty low level. Seaborn, on the other hand, is built on top of matplotlib and essentially took all the stuff that you do usually and made those operations in Seaborn. So, what I find uh, Seaborn particularly good at, which is difficult in matplotlib, is producing things like heat maps um, or dealing with categorical variables, for example. Um, the one downside to Seaborn, though, that I've run to every now and then is that it can be cumbersome to like, really easily manage the low-level aspects of a graphic. Um, so if you're really looking to do that, matplotlib is probably a, a better choice for you. And then another tool that's worth mentioning, and it's available in a number of different languages, is Plotly. Um, and this is worth mentioning because both Seaborn and Matplotlib are open source uh, tools. Plotly is, while there is a community edition, there's also an enterprise edition, and it is supported by um, an actual company. Uh, personally, I really like Plotly Dash, um, which produces essentially a, um, like a dashboard for you in your browser with a bunch of interactive uh, uh, graphs within it. And they do that by building on top of Flask, Plotly.js, and React.js. And there's, of course, like the normal offerings, which you might have used, which is called Plotly for Python now. Um, and this is where you can create just individual graphics and, and use those locally. Um, what's nice about Plotly compared to Matplotlib and Seaborn is that it allows you to focus on interactive graphics. Um, so if you're trying to like zoom in or out um, or change your perspective on a graphic, like Plotly is almost always my go-to. Because um, you can't honestly do that in Seaborn or Matplotlib that I know of. So in, where of, in terms of where these tools actually fit in um, in our architecture, um, it's mainly on the, what I consider like the analysis side. So this is really looking at when we're developing models, like how are we progressing, our tweaks that we're making to the algorithm or the um, like neural network, for example, actually panning out like we think they are. Uh, model training, obviously we want to know the performance of our model, how well it's performing, and performance analysis probably the most important thing that we actually do any data visualization for, um, that's really telling us how our models are working in the field. Um, we, obviously, our models run over tens of millions of pieces of content a day, so having like a graphic that can easily tell us is, is the model performance holding or decaying is, is critical in our architecture. This is probably the, one of the more interesting uh, slides in terms of tools, but these are all our modeling tools. Um, Spacey is probably one of the, my favorite frameworks right now, and it's the framework that we use uh, for virtually all of our natural language processing models. Um, it's a relatively new framework. It came out uh, like three or four years ago, I believe. But what's different about Spacey compared to all the other MLP frameworks I've looked at is that they are laser focused on production usage uh, of natural language processing tasks. Um, they like to call it industrial strength because of that. Uh, and it's, in my opinion, arguably one of the fastest MLP frameworks out there today. Um, the only downside to Spacey is if you worked with things like the Natural Language Toolkit, um, it's far less fully featured than those. Um, so there is a trade-off there for that kind of like focus on production usage. You are losing features because of that. Uh, what's really nice about Spacey is, by default, it uses um, a deep learning framework called Think, which is by the same makers. And Think is specifically uh, a deep learning framework that's optimized for natural language processing tasks that run on the CPU, um, which is very different than what you hear about most deep learning frameworks today, which are more or less focused on GPUs. Um, but in production use, you're generally um, not running your model's inference 
on GPUs because uh, that gets expensive very quickly. You're generally running on CPU. So the fact that they have this framework that is optimized for CPU, I, in my opinion, is a huge uh, kind of plus to Spacey. Uh, what's also nice, though, is Spacey is very flexible. So if you don't like Think, for example, or you want to use a GPU, um, it's easily replaceable with uh, like Keras or TensorFlow um, if you want to use those deep learning tools. Another thing uh, I wanted to mention is Prodigy. And this is what I'm going to live demo um, at the end of this. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But Prodigy is a uh, amazing tool that we have recently discovered. Um, and it's actually by the makers of Spacey. Um, Explosion AI. And what it does um, most critically is it solves the labeling problem. Uh, like I mentioned before, we deal with most of our models are based on our supervised learning models. So that means we have to go through and label data. And if you're working with uh, like deep learning and, and neural networks, you need a lot of data. Um, that's kind of the trade off for not having to do feature engineering. So Prodigy makes it really easy to create these large data sets that we need to work with. And like I said, I'll talk more about that. So the uh, moving on is um, scikit-learn or sklearn. And probably most of you have heard about this too. It's probably just as big as like um, NumPy uh, in, in the Python world. But this is probably the machine learning library, if I had to pick one. Um, it has support for most machine learning algorithms. Um, so since you, most of you are familiar with it, with it like, I just wanted to mention two downsides to sklearn. Uh, one is that it does not support distributed learning, um, which if you're working with big data sets, that, that can be a problem. Um, and the other is that it does not support GPU-based calculations, and they don't plan on doing that either. So again, if you're working with big data, sklearn is probably not the framework that you're going to want to go with. Uh, another thing worth mentioning is that there are also uh, a number of other um, side kits out there. Um, one of the other big ones that we use quite a bit is uh, scikit image. And Scikit Image has a bunch of really computer vision focused machine learning algorithms. And lastly is Keras. And for us, we use Keras backed by TensorFlow. Um, if you haven't used Keras, it's, um, it's essentially a high level deep learning framework. What's really nice about Keras is that you have programmatic definition of models. So you actually de create and define the models within your Python code versus trying to define models within configuration files, which can quickly grow out of control. Uh, and it's really a set of abstractions on top of these lower level backends. So that way, when you talk about Keras, you always need to know what is the actual framework that you're using behind the scenes with Keras. Um, and another really nice thing about Keras, if you haven't worked with it, is it kind of addresses some of the shortcomings with sklearn, where it does support uh, the GPU, and it does support distributed learning. And then TensorFlow, on the other hand, which I'm sure most of you have heard about, is a low-level mathematical framework. Um, but most of us use it in terms of deep learning tasks. Uh, so what's really nice is that the latest iteration of TensorFlow, its core library actually now supports Keras. Um, and that's partly, I think, a reason that both Keras and TensorFlow are essentially Google projects. Um, so they kind of may have that nice integration there. Um, Another really interesting thing about TensorFlow is that Google's um, TPUs, or tensor processing units, are specifically tailored to uh, TensorFlow. So if you're really trying to eke out every bit of performance that you can, looking at using TPUs with TensorFlow is a great thing to think about. Um, and what's really nice about both Keras and TensorFlow is they both have predefined and often pre-trained models. So this is great, because it can really help bootstrap your models if um, transfer learning is an option for you. This is where um, all these tools fit in. So I want to note on the analysis side, you can see that Prodigy is pretty much is evolved at every aspect um, within our analysis environment. And I'll show you exactly why that is here in a second. Um, obviously, just the, the rest of the modeling frameworks are just involved in terms of development and training. And then these frameworks, again, we use those for inference in our enrichment pipeline. Lastly, deployment tools. Um, this one's pretty simple. Um, really, we just wrap our models with uh, an HTTP REST API. Uh, for us, we ended up going with SANIC. Um, we originally were using Flask, but however, it wasn't performant enough. And honestly, running a WYSIWYG container uh, or WYSIWYG server within a container on top of a Python server was just overkill. So we personally went with SANIC. Um, 
What I really like about Stanic is that it's a web server and framework that is specifically focused on high performance. So because the REST APIs for our models are very basic, using something like Stanic is a great option for us. Um, what's also really nice is that it has a very Flask-like framework API. So originally, when we developed some of our models, we were using Flask. It was almost a drop-in replacement to use Stanic. Um, so converting over, at least for our very simple API for our models, was, was dead simple. Um, the downside to Stanic, though, is some of the older versions still support 3.5, but the newest versions now only support 3.6 plus. So if you have to, um, if you can't use that version of Python, Stanic is not going to work for you. And then Django, I'm really not even going to talk about it because I'm pretty sure most of you already are familiar with it. Uh, but it's just an MVC web framework, and we use Django for the actual API that we expose to our customers. And this is, for us, how we create alerts and how our analysts interact with those alerts and take actions on them. Now, as you can see here, um, we have Stanic here wrapping our HTTP model, or our, yep, our HTTP models, and then Django uh, for our actual REST API that we expose. All right, so now this is where um, I talk a, a lot more about Prodigy. So like I mentioned, Prodigy is probably one of the best tools that I've found for enabling data science, especially supervised learning. Um, and it was created by Explosion AI, which I mentioned before, the makers of Spacey and Think. And if you haven't heard of either Matt or Inns, they I consider both of them to be kind of titans within the natural language processing space. Um, they designed Prodigy to make annotating data very simple. Um, it's almost like uh, it's like Tinder for data, almost, is the best way to think about this interface. Um, but what's so powerful about Prodigy is that you can use it to do much, much more. Um, we actually define our entire model workflow from data acquisition to cleaning to actually um, training the model and deploying it all within Prodigy recipes. So everything that we do with that model is now mostly just uh, a one-line CLI command. Um, the one downside to Prodigy, though, is most of the tools I've been talking to so far are free tools. Prodigy is not. Um, Prodigy is actually a tool you have to purchase. It's fairly cheap. I think it's $390 for individual license and $490 for a, a team license for a company. Um, but you, it is a lifetime license. And what you get is a Python package that allows you to kind of run Prodigy. Um, so why Prodigy? Why are we using it? The main thing is it's solving the hardest problem in applied data science, which to me is labeling data. Um, labeling data consumes so much time, and making sure that you get the right data is critical. Um, very importantly to me is when you're dealing with a mess of code, um, especially that tends to happen with data science teams, is that Prodigy forces you to pro programmatically define the entire model workflow within a recipe. And this really, I think, helps you organize your thoughts and organize the way that you go and approach the problem that you're working with. Uh, out of the box, and this is actually something I'll show, but it supports Spacey. So if you do a lot of natural language processing, Prodigy is going to make your work so much easier. Um, and it does support computer vision annotation, too. And it's actually how we've trained our, um, one of our most recent com uh, computer vision models for object detection. Um, and what's finally really nice about Prodigy is that all the models that you train within it, you can export as Python packages. So you get that Python package. You have essentially some boilerplate code to create a HTTP API, install that Python package, and you can deploy your model usually within a day. So this is where I hope that the demo gods are with me, because we're going to do this live. So the first thing I want to show you um, it's just what I have here in this directory. So this, these are a couple of files I created um, for this meetup. So the first thing I want to point out is this Prodigy file right here, that wheel. That is what you get when you actually purchase Prodigy. And you get it for all three uh, major operating systems, so Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, the other thing I want to point out is this Prodigy.json file, which is not much to it right now. Uh, but this allows you to kind of define some basic settings that the Prodigy is going to use. So one of the things you'll notice is that I have database settings here. And Prodigy, behind the scenes, uses a relational database to keep track of the annotations in the data that you're, you're labeling as you go through your process. Um, so what I've done here is I've just set up, I have a, 
uh, Postgres container running right now just on my local host. Um, so that's what we're just going to use uh, right now, to the back prodigy. Um, so with that, the first thing that we're going to do with Prodigy is you create a data set. And can everyone see this, by the way? I'm not cutting this off too bad. So to do that, um, you have this command called Prodigy. You can see that here it's telling you these are all the built-in recipes that are available that you can use. Um, so you can see it's just like a, a CLI command that you can, you can execute once you've pip installed that, that wheel. So what I'm going to do here is show you one of the commands, which is a data set. So every um, Prodigy kind of project starts off with creating a data set. And that data set is going to be what stores our data. Uh, so in this case, um, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how we can train a negative sentiment classifier. So to do that, I'm first going to create a data set. We'll just call it negative sentiment. Um, and then we'll give it Um, kind of like a, a helper string so I know what I'm looking at in the database. And then I'll let it know that I am the author of this data set. It would help if I actually put data set. So you can see it has a pretty nice error command too. <laughs> Um, so here I've created the negative sentiment data set, and this has now been um, essentially placed into the database. So now if I want to see what's actually going on with this data set, I can just do prodigy stats in the name of the data set. In this case, you can see there's absolutely nothing going on with this data set because we haven't put any data into it yet. So that's the next thing that we're going to do, is we're going to put some data into this to train an actual negative sentiment classifier. So the first thing uh, I'm going to show you um, is we're going to actually call GitHub issues and try to find some negative GitHub issues um, to actually annotate and put into our data set. So out of the box, uh, Prodigy actually supports this. And to make it easier on us, too, we're actually going to do active learning. If you're not familiar with what active learning is, it's running a model essentially in parallel. So every time I annotate something, we're going to update that model with that new piece of data. So as you go through and annotate, your model is getting smarter and smarter. And then what's happening behind the scenes with Prodigy is that it starts to, as your model starts to improve, it only starts to surface um, data to you that the model is uncertain of. So what you're doing is that things that the model knows is kind of throwing out because you don't necessarily need that data. But the things that the model is struggling with or can't really decide what to do with, that's what you're going to surface. And theoretically, that's going to improve your model, make a, a, a stronger classifier. So again, this is a, a built-in recipe called textcat.teach. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to use the negative sentiment data set. And that's the where to put the, bottle, the um, data. And then I'm also going to bootstrap, or, uh, bootstrap um, this uh, model with a pre-trained uh, classifier that uh, Spacey has. And this uh, classifier in particular is trained on, uh, onto notes, if you've heard of that data set. Um, and this is what they call their small version of it. So uh, in terms of a, like the query that we're going to use for GitHub, um, we'll just put in mean. Uh, that seems like a fairly negative word. And then what I'm doing by specifying API at GitHub is telling it, hey, go out to GitHub, grab those issues, search for essentially this word mean in GitHub issues, and return back those issues to me. And lastly, we need to, since this is supervised learning, I need to assign a label for this data. So we'll just call that label negative. So now that I've done all this, you can see that there's now um, a web server running uh, locally on 8080. Oh, we lost my browser. So if you go to this annotation server, um, you're kind of greeted with the Prodigy screen. Uh, one of the things I want to note is that you can have any number of annotators working at this at once. So one of the things that we actually do at Xerofox, especially to build like some of our larger data sets, is we try to get everyone in the company involved with doing these annotations. So when you've got 200 some people going and annotating data, you get a lot of annotated data really quick. 
Um, and one of the things, if you do have multiple annotators, is you can actually put in specific instructions for those annotators. So we've got a number of different models, and they all have to be annotated slightly differently. So this is where I can drop in specific instructions, and people can see that. So now what we're going to do um, is basically do uh, Tinder for data. So all of this um, is supported with keyboard shortcuts. So A is accept, X is reject. A would say, like, yes, this is a negative comment. Reject would say, no, this is not a negative comment. And then you can ignore. And ignore just says, like, don't pay attention to this. Like, I can't necessarily make a decision about this uh, piece of data. So in this case, I don't think that is negative. So we're just reject it. Uh, nope. Not negative, not negative, not negative, not negative, not negative. All right, you guys probably get the point here, but it's GitHub. Like, there, it's fairly unlikely that there's going to be a whole bunch of negative comments within GitHub issues. So, although maybe if you're a software engineer, some of this stuff's pretty negative. Um, so, we'll just go ahead and save those. You can already see that. Now this is saying that we're about, we have about 9% of the data that the model needs. So let's uh, move off of GitHub and let's move on to Twitter. I'm sure we can find some negative comments on Twitter. <laughs> and actually, one of the things I want to show here first before I is this is where the power of Prodigy starts to come in. Um, so you can define these, what are called recipes for Prodigy. So in this case, what's really nice is that Prodigy actually already provided a, uh, essentially a Twitter stream for me. However, it is Twitter, so I have to authenticate to their, their API. And that's not information you want to pass in over the command line, necessarily. So what I've done here is I've created a very simple recipe where all I do is specify the data set, the model, the label, just like I did before, and uh, the Twitter query that we're going to run. And then we call this teach uh, function, which is coming actually from Prodigy. And it's the same textcot.teach text um, command that you saw me run earlier. But in this case, instead of the source being GitHub, I've replaced it with Twitter. And I've cleverly hidden my uh, Twitter secrets from you guys. And that's it. That is it for the Twitter recipe. That is going to let us pull in Twitter data and do active learning um, to label it. So that's what we're going to do right now. So textcat.teach. And the reason that I'm putting negative underscore sentiment dot textcat dot teach is that is the name of the recipe that you can see right here. So negative sentiment is our data set. Again, we'll just uh, bootstrap with that same um, Eng small English model. Our label is negative. And who's got a good negative query for me to search for some, some negative tweets? Which hunt? All right. Which hunt it is? All right. I mean, it's Twitter. It's probably both. <laughs> All right, so we got a query. Um, and then last, I just need to specify the actual recipe file to use since this is not a built-in recipe. So that's just done with that dash F flag. And then I just tell it the Twitter recipe. So assuming I typed in everything right, it, the web server starts up. And I don't know what's going to show up, so <laughs> Twitter. Um, this one, this is an interesting one. I'm not really sure if this is negative or not, so we'll just ignore it. Um, probably not really negative. Yeah. <laughs> um, doesn't seem negative. That's. That's probably negative. <laughs> yeah, that's negative. <laughs> um, 
probably negative. That's a, we'll ignore that one. That's iffy. Um, they would not stop investigating. Definitely not negative. Uh, we're going to ignore that one. Uh, not negative. <laughs> Uh, probably negative. Not negative. That's probably negative. Uh, that's <laughs> negative. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's negative. Nah, that's negative. Negative. So we had a bunch that weren't. I mean, and honestly, if I was running through this, I'd also be putting in queries for like things I think would be kind of associated with like positive or neutral sentiment. Um, this is obviously just a quick demo, so we're just kind of throwing, throwing stuff into it. Can, can it be like uh, sort of internet rater reliability, like any kind of like where multiple people are rating the same thing to make sure everyone's on the same page? It can do that. Okay. Um, so there's, I'll, I'll actually show you what that setting is really quick. So. in this prodigy.json file. So I have this feed overlap set to false. But if I set that to true, that would mean that every single annotator that went and was annotating within Prodigy, they would all see get essentially a duplicate stream of the data. So that's how you could get multiple annotators doing it. And then you can obviously do some kind of correlation or whatever you want to do to kind of make a final determination on the label. Yep, and that's really, at the end of the day, with natural language processing, with these kind of classifiers, that's really what you're trying to teach, is you're trying to get that model to understand the context. Because otherwise, if I just had, I could honestly just use a word list. If I'm like, all right, I've got mean, bad, I don't, I don't know, ugly. Like you say, these are all like negative words. And just look them up if they're in the text, like boom, done. Like You could say it's negative. But the point of using a classifier is it can take account the whole context of the text that you're working with um, to figure out that you know this is this is mean being used in the negative contents versus versus mean being used in like maybe the mathematical sense. How do you get over the annotator bias? I mean, because you're, you're teaching it what you think. Okay. People can think this about particular guest information. Yep, and that's actually why his question was so pertinent is because that's why you want multiple annotators all looking at duplicate data. Because then you can kind of hope that you know like the law of averages will will pan out for you. But no, that's a great question. That's a problem. That's a, just a general machine learning problem, is that um, the bias that you put into your labeling and your data set affects like the end, the end performance of the model. How complicated can your query be? Like, right now you just put in the stream of something, and you have to do it on top of it. Yeah. Um, and let's actually do that. Let's do something positive so we can get some positive examples in here. Um, so let's do, I don't know, like, I love ice cream. That seems pretty positive. <laughs> well, yeah, that might be negative for some people. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Not what I was expecting to see. <laughs> oh, this is live stream right, too? Oh, boy. So actually, on this last one, I made a mistake. I actually accepted it, um, and that is clearly not negative, like having negative sediment. So I can actually go back and kind of address that mistake that I just did. So fix that. Uh, I don't know. It just seemed negative. Oh my gosh. All right, we're done with this ice cream one. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna avoid the love piece. <laughs> All right, so I think we've got so, enough data to at least demonstrate training the model now. Um, so first, let's just like make sure that we actually have some data within this data set. Cool, we didn't. I forgot to save at one point, so we ended up with seven. Um, let me actually, I need to add some accept into here. All right, I'm hoping this is a safe word. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not really negative. Not negative. Not really negative. That's probably negative. It's probably negative. All right. Now we should have some some distribution there. All right. So there we go. We've got two negative ones and twelve that we rejected. Um, so now what we're going to do is actually train our model. So this is just. Um, this is actually using an out-of-the-box recipe called batch train. And this is obviously not really going to learn anything because we only have 19 samples and that's not nearly enough to train a, a model. But uh, for demonstration purposes, you'll at least see like how easy this is. Um, so again, negative 7. And again, we're going to bootstrap this model with that small English model uh, that Spacey has. And then for our output, I'm going to drop this into uh, just a directory called train model. Um, and then for our eval split, uh, let's do 0.1 because I really don't have that much data to work with. Um, but this is where you can choose kind of like your uh, train test split for your data set. Um, and then for iterations, it's not going to matter because this thing won't learn anything. So we'll just say 10. Should be pretty quick. And then the batch size, we'll set the just two because we have barely any data. So now it's going to go through and run. And of course, that just flies through because it's not a whole lot of data there. Look, we got one right. So we have a perfect model. Um, <laughs> but you can see here, like it's actually outputting through each of the iterations that it goes through. It's giving you the F1 score, your accuracy score, as well as your loss. Um, so this would look a lot more interesting with more data, but giving just 19 samples, like it, it's pretty boring. And unfortunately, we only had one sample around for our, um, for our test set due to the way we did the split. And you can see that it was a rejected sample, so it was not negative sentiment, and the model actually got that right. So now uh, the model is actually saved to this trained model directory. And there's a lot more than just the model here. So the model itself is actually stored uh, within this textcat directory. But what's really nice um, about Prodigy and how it works, with, at least with this default recipe, is that both your evaluation and training data is actually written out. So if I wanted to, I could go back and exactly replicate this model if I need to do that in the future for some reason. Um, so now, uh, now that we have a trained model, let's actually see how well this thing does. So again, this is a recipe that I wrote. For at least for this one, like with the out of the box one, it's just a deep learning neural network um, with a couple of convolutions, and I think I can't remember how many layers exactly off the top of my head. You can, yeah, you could uh, if you want to. You could plug in your own um, using TensorFlow, Keras, Think, uh, whatever kind of like framework you want to use. Uh, so this this recipe um, again, I'm just sourcing from Twitter, which I'm now thinking is a bad idea. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to actually just send in some random data off of Twitter, let the model run over it, and then we'll give our opinion on it. And then I'll show you at the end, we'll actually see um, how well our model did based on like what we thought um, the data should be classified as. So this is textcot.eval. Um, and then uh, do negative, oops. 
actually that's not going to do anything because I forgot to create my evaluation data set because I want to keep my evaluation data set separate from my training data set. So we'll just call this negative sentiment eval demo cool created that so now I've got my negative sentiment eval data set created um, and we'll have it use the train model and not that default um, kind of model uh, bootstrap model that we've been using uh, previous. Again, labels negative. And for the query, I'm trying to think of something safe. Um, <laughs> we'll try uh, wash. No, that's a bad idea. <laughs> we'll do tabletop. Um, <laughs> And then again, this is a custom recipe because I'm uh, using Twitter. So specify that. So now we go back to our friendly annotation. OK, that's safe enough. Um, so that is not negative. Not negative. Not negative. Hmm, not negative. All right, we'll save these. So, and then now when I kill this, you're going to see what the results were. So, in this case, our model got all six right. Um, my guess is this model is probably just defaulting to saying everything is not negative. Um, but you can see here that it prints out all of the kind of like critical stats that you're going to want to know um, when you're evaluating your model. Um, and there's a couple of other built-in recipes, too, where you can uh, produce kind of like your uh, ROC curves and, and so on. But this was just kind of an example of how you can do the evaluation side and the training side. Um, do I have uh, enough time, or when is this supposed to wrap up? Probably seven minutes ago? OK, so really quickly, one of the things I just wanted to show everyone is uh, it's support for computer vision. Um, so I'll keep this pretty quick, but one of the things I'm just going to do is show you how we can actually go and use Prodigy to classify um, pictures for use in an object detection model. So in this case, we're going to do uh, weapon detection. So we'll say guns and guns and knives are what we're looking for. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm updating this because you're going to see that I'm going to need Prodigy to recognize that now I'm using. Um, I have more than one label. So in this, in this case, I have gun and knife. You could probably think of other weapons like, I don't know, nunchucks or something like that. Uh, but we'll keep it simple. The other thing to mention here, and I'll just briefly show you it just so you can understand, but we won't look too hard at the code, is there's a site called Pixabay. Um, if you do any kind of computer vision, Pixabay is amazing because it's essentially a site full of royalty-free images. Um, so you can just go download those and use them, and it's amazing. So what I did is I just wrote this very simple class that wraps uh, essentially the Pixabay API. And what it does is it just gets examples um, and then yields those examples essentially up to Prodigy for you to annotate it, and it just keeps doing that. And then the actual recipe that I wrote is, again, pretty simple. I just declare uh, essentially the data stream, which is that Pixabay class that I created. And then I return these components in this case. Uh, and these components just say, like, hey, here's the data set. Here's the actual image view to render, which what we were seeing before was what they call the classification view. This is going to be the uh, manual image view. We can actually go and annotate on top of the images to draw our bounding boxes. Um, the stream is just the Pixabay stream. And then um, the progress and update also come from the stream. And that's just as some of the information that you see on this side. So to do this, uh, this is, uh, again, like pretty straightforward. Pixabay image manual. Um, and I forgot to create my data set. Shoot. So Prodigy Pixabay. 
manual, our weapon status set. Um, in this case, we're going to search Pixabay for the word uh, for images with hopefully guns in them, and then we'll use that Pixabay recipe. So now, um, what we should see is an image showing up here pretty soon. I'm going to have to shrink this a little bit. And here we go. So we've got ourselves a gun. So we'll just go ahead and label that. So there's our gun. On to the next one. Uh, no gun, so we'll reject that. <laughs> <laughs> Dubious. <laughs> yep, got a gun here. Um, again, another gun here. So you can see, like, you can actually move pretty fast. And I don't know if anyone's ever tried to label data for an object detector. It is, this makes it so painless. Um, it is not normally this painless. And what's really nice, too, is you can also do multiple objects. So yeah, this guy right here, this dog, definitely, definitely a gun. Um, but that's what's really powerful about this. And all this is annotated. It's available um, out of the database as a JSON document, which makes it really easy to work with um, downstream if you want to kind of uh, shift the data out of Prodigy and into, say, um, like Keras or something like that. Uh, so with that, that's really uh, the end of uh, this demo. And uh, I guess I'll open up for any questions. Yes? Talking about when you're going through and you said 9%, what kind of happened there versus the 10% that you have in that So it, it in that case, we're using the default recipe. So what um, Prodigy is trying to do behind the scenes is it's also looking at the data that's coming in. Um, and, and based on the data that's coming in, it's trying to figure out how certain of the model is uh, for the data that's coming in. And then based off of that, it's able to do um, some calculations to basically say, like, yes, I need this much more data, or no, I don't. Um, the percentages with active learning aren't like perfectly accurate. Um, but they give you kind of a general idea of, OK, I've probably hit a point where I've got enough data to like at least test out my idea. Okay. Is it related to the, um, the model that you're putting on the back end? So you're making sure you're using the accurate data for the machine learning and you're connecting to that? Or is that separate from that? Yes. Yeah, it does. Um, like that model is actually running. So every time you, when you're doing active learning with Prodigy, um, every time you label something, that model gets updated with just that single piece of data. Go down the line. Um, so the annotated data becomes your uh, training data set. And then the point of the active learning is just to give you an idea of, like, I have gathered enough data for my model. The, the model's uh, um, kind of score would, would not be added to that, that uh, data. Although you could, if you wanted to create your own recipe, you could add that information to it, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily help much. Sanic. Um, so I believe there is um, like a, a hook that you can define uh, that before the actual like web server starts up, like you can do like your database connections. Um, that's where then if you wanted to like actually call out code and like download the model's checkpoint from S3 or something, you could do that there. Um, you mean within the annotation sure. interface? Yeah, yeah, so you can't. I didn't. I didn't uh, demonstrate that, but that is 100% supported in um, in the in uh, Prodigy. 
Yes. That's a good question. Um, normally, I just run the experiment. Um, I generally tend to find, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what the exact um, uh, like word that they use for it. Um, but we tend to use their like large model, which isn't their largest model. Um, but it was trained on on two notes and one other data set. And I find that that works better than that like small model that was dem demoing, which was just trained on on two notes. Uh, but that's really, for me, just uh, like trial and error, trying to see, like, hey, if I bootstrap it with this one or versus that one, like, what happens? Yes? Yeah, there's a ton. Pretty much anything that involves um, natural language processing, like, they have default recipes for it um, that all work with Spacey. Uh, for computer vision, most of those you have to define. Um, an earlier version of Prodigy, they actually were trying to do uh, something similar for computer vision that they did with natural language processing, where they had a bunch of default recipes. Um, they were trying to do that by wrapping the uh, YOLO v2 model. Um, but they ultimately ended up, it looks like, killed it because they took out those default recipes. But you can see it's, very, it's pretty simple to, to write them. Um, and that's actually what we did for object detection models. We just ended up writing our own recipe. Um, computer vision is a little bit harder, though, than I think natural language processing. Um, just because there's like so many different things you can do and how you do it, so like it's almost like you have to create your own recipes at the end of the day. Are there any other domains where you tried to create your own system? Or? Um, so those are the only two that I've used Prodigy for. Um, I could definitely see you use, using it in really anything where you need to have labeled data. Um, I could see Prodigy being extremely useful for. So this is where things get really interesting, and I haven't done this with Prodigy, but I know it's possible, is that kind of like central framework where you're displaying the text or the images, that's just HTML. You can write your own views. So if you wanted to do audio, you could write your own view for audio that would essentially just play it. Yeah, that was, I was talking to a tool, but it's the same thing. You could do the same thing with video. So they definitely don't have anything like that out of the box. But if you can write that view, if you can write the HTML and CSS essentially for it, like it's it'll run in Prodigy. So you could definitely do that. Can you just train like a gun stop or something? Like you get you know uh, surveillance cameras yeah. all over the city, and you put a gun stop, and you can train it to play it. I I could see. So something like that, I could definitely see you doing. Again, like it's not out of the box, but given it's so flexible, like basically any piece of Prodigy, like the recipes, the views, and um, even like the data stores that you talk to, um, you can override, write your own, do custom stuff with. So Prodigy is like very modular, which makes it, in my opinion, such a powerful tool. Because um, as long as you know Python, you can essentially do whatever you want. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Have you found that, you know, you mentioned you guys have like clips and people will kind of see the plate working, but have you found that active learning most of what you all do has been able to accomplish? Or are there areas that you're like, if we had, you know, five to a thousand employees, we would have been, because I imagine the active learning traffic would increase with the amount of time you need to train people. Um. So I haven't used active learning for any of our computer vision models. Um, I'm still trying to figure out in like, my head how that would work, because I, like, I need to bootstrap the models. So like, maybe now that I have like, some existing models, I could use those as kind of like the, the bootstrap model to like, label the pictures, and then people can go yes, no. But also at the end of the day with like, our computer vision models, at least for image classifiers, I think that'd be easier. But if we're talking like object detection, like 
even if the model is wrong, like I still need to know where it was wrong. So that means someone's got to go and annotate. So active learning, I don't, I haven't found to be as useful there. But for the natural language processing stuff, like I demoed, like I find it to be immensely valuable. Yeah. I did, I did look at them. I didn't um, POC some of them. And I also looked at a couple of uh, um, like uh, open source tools as well. And Prodigy, just given like the flexibility of it, the fact that it, was, like, it works so well with Python, which is basically all we use, um, it, it was kind of like a no-brainer. And also, the cost was like fairly low. And it's a one-time cost. So um, it kind of just worked really well for our, our situation. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate you listening.